only thing we have to fear is beer itself. Beer. So many choices. Oh, we no function beer well without. Woohoo! Beer! Welcome to another episode of Beer Busters, where we're going to bring you the news and reviews of some wonderful brews. My name is Dan Baker, joined, as always, by my co-host and brewologist, Steph Hefner, and the demented and fermented, Wayne Baker. And today, we're coming at you live from Columbia Kettle Works, somewhere we have, as Wayne's yelling and flipping out, flipping off his phone, uh, somewhere we've we've been meaning to come out here for a while. I've never been here, and I'm very Shame happy to be here. I know, you. I know, I know. It's just, it's a little bit of a hike from Philly, but definitely worth it from what I'm seeing so far. And uh, we've got a couple guys with us at the table. You guys are kind enough to donate some time with us. So if we can have, have you guys introduce yourself, we've got... Chad Ricker. Rod Smith. And, and Bill Collister. Gentlemen, thank you so much for having us out here and for, uh, for joining us on the show. I, uh, I had a sip of Wayne's beer earlier. He ordered a beer before uh, he got a sandwich. And what beer are you drinking, Wayne? I am drinking the Hefeweizen. I, t- I stole a sip of that, and it was delicious. It so is really delicious. I'm looking forward to what's coming down the line. I ordered it specifically because I knew it would be a good starter beer, and it would go well with a nice, good... Uh, Ted Underhill sandwich that I had. It's Ted like a Underhill rare sandwich. roast beef sandwich. And with that, all the meat juice. That looked really good. Delicious, and I spilled it all there over it our tablecloth. Yeah, the tablecloth got a taste of it also. Cool. But uh, I'm very I'm very happy to be here. It's going to be a great night. I can already tell. The beers, I'm told, are great. The sip of the heffy that I had sure lends to that. We should start off by mentioning that the episode is, of course, brought to you by Audible. You can go to audibletrial.com slash beerbuster. Sign up for your free 30-day trial of an Audible account where you can Download, listen to, and keep an audiobook of your choosing. There's over 250,000 titles you can choose from, so really anything that you want pretty much is on there, whether you want it to be the uh, long-fabled science of Star Trek, whether you want uh, Jim Cook's new book, whether you want really anything. Your choice, audibletrial.com slash beerbusters. And you can also go to patreon.com slash beerbusters and become a patron. Uh, help support the show and get cool behind-the-scenes perks and uh, get your your golden ticket to the Beer Busters Super Awesome Kids Club. Patreon.com slash Beer Busters. Super Awesome Kids Club? <laughs> exactly. All right. 21 and older kids club. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't kids re- in the loose definition. Must be 21 and over. The award-winning Potts Town Brew Fest, of course, is returning to Manitoni Park this October 22nd for a celebration of craft beer. Come on out and join us as we sample over 150 beers and ciders from over 65 of the best craft breweries in the Mid-Atlantic. Don't forget about those VIP tickets. They are selling out quickly. VIP session starts at noon, and it is limited to only 350 people, $75. Come on out and enjoy those exclusive beers, including one from 2SP. Yay! Exciting. Yeah. And the open invitation will still stand for our 100th episode. Uh, we started planning a little bit more for what's going to go down. Seems like it's going to be a great night. It's also Canal Street's um, Sour Tap takeover that night. So a lot of really cool stuff on tap. And there's, of course, the extensive bottle and can list that you can choose from. There's going to be live music from the Pat and Greg duo. We're going to be there doing an actual live broad, broadcast podcast. Br- yeah, we'll There'll figure- be speakers. There's going to be speakers. So you actually hear what's going on. <laughs> Raffles. We're g- it's going to be a nice trip down memory lane while kind of... Uh, Enjoying the company of everybody that's there. Um, we have a phone number set up. You can call us. Um, we're going to be doing some live tweeting and live texting for things during the show as well. Uh, by the way, that number, if you want to, we, we tested it out. We know it works. Well, now. while Dan digs out the number, we should probably tell them when, when this it is. is. Well, it's September 23rd at 6 p.m. at did, Canal Street Restaurant and Pub in Reading, Pennsylvania. That? No, the number you, is Radio that. Man. 805-991-2337. Which spells beer. Which is also beer. Yes. 805-991-BEER. So go ahead and text us. Go ahead and uh, call us. Leave a voicemail. I think it's going to go straight to voicemail at this point. Just let us know you're out there. Say hi. That's all we really want. Uh, but I feel like we should get the show on the road and do this. It's been a while since we recorded. And I'm sure there's a lot that's happened, but I wanted to try to get something that was relatively timely. So I've got a couple articles that are worth sharing. Uh, first thing, now I reported on it a while ago when uh, they made the announcement of Stone getting into the European market. But uh, as of pretty recently, nearly seven years in the making, American craft beer has made a milestone leap in Europe's time-honored beer culture. Stone Brewing has announced that its Berlin, Germany brewery is now fully operational, and the company is now distributing its beers to 17 countries throughout Europe. The milestone further solidifies the brewery's historic accomplishment of becoming the first U.S. craft brewery to independently build, own, and operate a brewery in Europe. 
Uh, for generations, America was considered the laughing stock of the world when it came to beer because we had beers like the things that are calling themselves America. Yeah, if only we could fix our politics. <laughs> well, let's not get started there. Uh, and while the old image is now decades out of touch, former low opinion American beer still survives in Europe. So Stone is proud to be able to demonstrate to Europeans that American craft beer is now a proud and mighty part of our culture in the U.S., which is light years beyond what we were known for. So some quick facts. Uh, released in June 2016 was the Stone IPA and the Arrogant Bastard Ale. In July was the Stone Ruination Double IPA and the Cali Belgique, they're calling it, IPA. And uh, as far as distribution goes, they are getting into Austria, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Latvia, Lithuania, the Netherlands, Norway, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Poland, and the UK. French, Guiana, Barbados, and Guam. Guam. Exactly. I wonder how it'll sell. So h- how does Ryan Heiskaboot laws work then? Well, well I think apparently really it's more, more of a suggestion. suggestions at this point. Yeah, yeah I don't think... Uh, Leave the Irish moss in California? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's cool to see that they're... Um, they're kind of trying to make right by Americans for our craft beer because there's there's a big craft beer culture. Obviously, I mean, how didn't we're this all happen with it. wine? Did it? Same thing happened with wine. Yeah, I don't know, I don't yeah, really pretty much. Wine. Yeah, it's, it's sort of the same kind of well, thing. Well, there's yeah. been quite a boom in craft beer, especially in Berlin, particularly in Germany, for the past few years. So I think at least the people of Berlin are probably ready to embrace this and this these non Reinheitsgebot beers and these overly hoppy beers. But I just wonder, as a whole. How, of course, if Lan- people from Lancaster County can come and drink IPAs and Russian Imperial Stouts, I guess the people of Germany can bring, drink American IPAs, too. I don't know. It'll yeah, be I'm interesting sure, to see how it sells. I'm sure there's there's a, a segment of beer drinkers in Germany and brewers, probably, who, who resent the the sort of... Not, not like the craft beer wave, but like particularly like the insurgence of American beer and, and those sort of like Reinheitsgebot only kind of very traditional, very sort of old-fashioned right but the american styles. craft beer is rooted in german immigrants anyway so it's like it's true they're it's true. going home i just i don't know i i, I hey, made, dad, this look what i did pure speculation but it's probably like a generational thing as well like you probably have like the the 20 somethings now in berlin are probably like fueling that sort of craft beer and the ones who are going to embrace american craft beer coming over there chad what do you think your great 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 <laughs> grandfather would say you could have stopped at three <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't born in the 1400s uh say about what about american beer in germany over in europe i he probably would have been shocked yeah yeah he was certainly uh proud of what was craft beer back then you know it's always interesting you know being that they were immigrants yet they came and they were full-blown Americans the moment they stepped off the boat. Right. For those that don't know, Chad has quite the uh, brewing. Brewing is definitely in his blood. What's your sixth generation brewer in your family? Is that correct? Right. So uh, you're, And Scott is your son, right? Correct. Scotty? Yep. Scotty will be a brewer too, right? That's the hope. He'll be seven. <laughs> yeah. No, he will. <laughs> yeah, he no already knows much. the four ingredients in beer, so that's yeah. the okay. first step. That's a good start. That's a good start. I didn't know that until I was like 23. So <laughs> he's got me beat. I'm assuming he's not 23 at this point. No, he's six. Okay, yeah. He's got me He's going into the first grade. All right. He's got, he's got a ways to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is, as I'm sure you can hear at this point, a band in the background. It's, uh, it's Razvio. Um, and I see her playing a violin, which is pretty cool. She's got a red microphone, and uh, the drummer's got a really cool electronic drum kit set up. I kind of I want that. I, the but, best thing of all about the band is that they are directly in front of the brewing equipment. Yeah, they're in the brewery. They're behind, behind the, the bar in yeah. front of the brewing equipment, and it's like the most awesome place to stick a band. She's playing violin in the mash tun. <laughs> Get the F out of the mash tun. <laughs> what you need to do is have barrels up here. So okay. that you can you can have special beers that were aged in barrels to the sounds of the various bands that play <laughs> here. Oh, geez. That has any effect like the on the beer? Yeah, like split a batch, one in the basement. Yeah, and then one up here with the band. Oh, I yeah. definitely think out of all genres of music, the barrel that would benefit best would be from the influence of heavy metal. Probably yes. Yeah, or yeah, it would or penetrate Wu-Tang the wood. Yeah, true. Wu Tang. We had the Dock Street. Uh, ain't nothing to funk with. Dock Street beer ain't nothing to funk with. Cool. That was serenaded by Wu Tang while it was aging. Yeah, and it was good. For I drink it. Time. <laughs> it was. It was good. It was good. It uh, it worked out well. Uh, another thing in the way of news: craft brewers, as we sure know, are still growing. Uh, according to new mid-year data released by the Brewers Association, 
which is, of course, the not-for-profit association dedicated to small and independent American brewers. So as of June 30th, 2016, a record high of 4,656 breweries are operating in the United States, which is an increase of 917 over the same time period from last year. I'm uh, still ahead, by the way. Oh, in untapped check-ins? I forgot that was our Steph competition. still has for it. more untapped check-ins than there are breweries in the country. Come on, America. <laughs> How many are you at now for check-ins? Over 5,000. That's disgustingly frightening. I'm at like <laughs> 700. Well, I forget to check a lot of things yeah. in. I think I just hit like 13. All right. Lucky number 13. 5,634 unique check ins. Wow. wow. Uh, additionally, to the 4,600 that are currently open, it's an increase of 917 over last year. There's approximately 2,200 breweries in planning. Oh so if God. they all open with none closing, that's going to beat your check in. That's a big if. That's a big if. That's yeah. a big if. Yeah. Uh, craft brewers are currently employing an estimated 121,843 full and part-time workers in a variety of roles, uh, according uh, anywhere from production to manufacturing to wait staff, anything like that. So 121,000 people are employed in this country because of craft beer. That actually beer. is lower than I thought it would be. Really? Yeah. What would you put it at? I don't know. I really don't know. My house mortgage debt thanks you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's, it's what we're here for. We're supporting the community, of course. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how it ends up by the end of the year. But 4,656 is the current operating tur- total. Current operating turtle as of uh, June 30th. <laughs> interesting. Yes. Yeah, I, what I want to know is when it's going to level out. When we, we started this podcast three years ago, mm-hmm. and well, yeah, I think it, the number yeah. then was around 2,000. Like, it's doubled in the past Did three we, years. Was it a 2,000? I think it was somewhere around there. I mean, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure. I don't remember if we crossed. I think it was around 2,000. I think early on early on in the days of Beer Busters, we, we talked about there being 2,000-some craft breweries. Yeah, and I know the, once the, we hit 4,000, I had an article about it on the site, which was, I think, late last year, beginning of this year. Um, wow. Yeah. So it's been, in three years, it's doubled, but still... Even as impressive as that is per capita, it's still not the highest amount the country's ever seen. Because as the population has grown, we're at 320 million people in the country now. Whereas prior to prohibition and everything, it was a much smaller population, but more breweries. The Brewers Association, their ultimate goal would be 20% of market share by 2020. Right, okay. All 20s. All right. That's easy to remember. Yes, it is. 20% <laughs> by 2020. 20, 20 by 2020. The 20th hour of the 20th day of the 20th month 2, of 2,822 in 2013. There you okay, go. so Step almost 3,000. So right. not quite but still, doubling. But, but still, still. It's, it's an impressive growth. And sure, there's some that are great and some that are not so great, but it's still it's a booming industry. And Yeah, I just I feel like I'm smelling it's going to start leveling off. I, like I'm, I'm feeling that the bubble's going to burst yeah, at some point. Well, I, and, and it burst maybe, but at least like a lot of these... You know, and we've talked about this a million times on the show, but a lot of these, you know, stovetop home brewers that are gonna that go out there and rent warehouse space and think I'm gonna open a brewery, like that's gonna they're gonna start to fall away. Yeah, because it's just not sustainable. Right. You gotta, you know. And there's there's some opinion pieces that I I'd seen about um, the oversaturation of it and what that's gonna lead to. Because I know where we're at now, we're lucky in central and eastern Pennsylvania. There's I think there's a healthy amount of breweries and places you can get good beer where it's not too much that you feel like it's kind of in your face but it's readily available for you when you want it i think we kind of luck out whereas some places like i know what california i think has the highest number of operating breweries in the country they i feel like in parts are probably oversaturated we were just in portland that's yeah you I, were. I was overwhelmed yeah because portland's it's a smaller town yeah. so how many so you tend to go on extra My goal used to be to get to every one. But I how many did that. you get to when you were there? And how many did you plan on getting to that you and might how not? Many, we got to more than we planned to. Okay. How many but did you write about that I have to post at our website? <laughs> <laughs> I'm yes. only writing one article. <laughs> follow, follow stuff on our beer ventures at beerbusterspodcast.com. Yeah. I, 20 maybe? That's still impressive. Fedge is there now. He went to 10 ye- two days ago and 7 yesterday. Jeez. Wow. Portland. That's insane. But you know what I'm realizing? What are you realizing? I'm realizing that I don't like it anymore. I don't like going to 10 breweries in a day. I want to go to one or two breweries and sit there and drink a lot at yeah. one brewery. You want to find breweries. Because you know. I'm like, I don't even remember. I'm writing about this brewery, and I'm like, what did I even drink? What did it even taste I like? I don't even minutes. know. I had one Because I had yeah. like one beer, or I had a sampler, and then it was moving on yep. to the next one, yep. and I, I don't like it. It's like We went to Cascade, and we actually spent like an hour and a half there, and it was heavenly. 
I drank like seven beers there and it was awesome. It, I, it was my favorite stop because I think I invested some time in going there. So I think it's more worth it to do research and choose a handful of breweries to go to than to try to do a shit ton of them. It's just... And you got to find For the me, breweries. I think we've reached like we've reached critical it. mass. That's that's a lot because yeah. you go to a lot of breweries. Well, yeah, and there was a time I had been to every brewery in Pennsylvania, and now there's breweries in Pennsylvania I've never even heard of. Are you frustrated because you can't keep up? I can't keep up. Stop it! <laughs> get flustered. You can hear enough it. Enough is enough. Stop it. <laughs> so there you go. The twenty two hundred breweries that are in planning. Wait for Steph to be able to catch up to yeah. some of you. Yeah, yeah wait. slow down. Yes. Hit the brakes. Take your time. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say, I think you need to find those breweries. That you can sit and hang out in. You know, a place like this is perfect because they serve yeah. food, they have tables, they've got music. You Live know, music. It's an awesome environment to sit and hang out in. Yeah. You My know. concern when this topic always comes up is just the quality factor. Exactly. Yeah. You know, how are how are all those breweries brewing and top quality yeah. beer? Yeah, and so they're the not. The answer is they're not. And then yeah. I get yeah. even more frustrated when I wasted my time going to brewery and the beer wasn't even good. And then money. I really get time mad. and money. Yeah, because it's expensive. Yeah. No matter where you're going, you're dropping seven dollars on a pint of beer, whether it's good or it's not good. All of us breweries, whether we're a half barrel or five hundred barrels, we all have a responsibility to each other to brew high quality beer. Yeah. Yep. yep. And I think there, there should be, in my opinion, a level of accountability with that. And as a brewer, if I were to brew, uh, I think I would appreciate the feedback from anyone, as long as you deliver it in a constructive way, of course. But I think... I Not think your beer is bad. Right. Yeah. You should uh, be able this to... Sucks. Uh, your beer is bad. But here is why. Here's why. <laughs> your beer does not taste right because it right. tastes like there's an infection in there. Here's what you can do to get it to come out. Well, and, and, the, and the risk is, is that people who are, are new to craft beer, uh, you know, people, unfortunately at this point much younger than us yeah. uh, who, are, who are just starting to drink it for the first time if they walk into a brewery that's serving shitty beer and that's their first craft beer experience then everybody loses yep, right. because exactly. they're not going to go seek out craft breweries that are making new life good or beer. new civilizations I always say high tides go. rise all ships you exactly know, yep. they'll have to yep. succeed yeah that's true so it's an interesting time we live in it's a uh, it's a good and bad time to be a beer lover. And another, I'm sorry, well, I don't mean, no, I don't no. mean to extend this. This anymore. is a very long news segment. <laughs> well, this is well, a very interesting topic. It's, it's We're getting fired up. When I originally came up with the idea to do news, I wanted it to be more of like talking points. So I'm glad this is what it became. Rod, I have to say though, Chad has spoken a lot more than you, and this is like blowing my mind right now. <laughs> well, you know, it was just hard enough to get him here. So <laughs> there's a gun to my back. <laughs> yeah. But the interesting thing is, and I was reading uh, about this recently, is that. Um, a lot of new breweries opening up now and a lot of people getting into the craft beer industry is not, you know, your group of friends who homebrewed together and decided to open their own place and kind of just, you know, take the risk and see. But there's a lot of investors. There's oh, there's like 15 lawyers. Bankers uh, and lawyers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. People who are, are, are looking at it as a pure business opportunity. And, you which, know, that was another thing that I had seen in one of these opinion articles that you're, instead of brewers that you have, it's going to be the investment bankers that are controlling the decisions. So if there's a beer that, that you put time and effort into that doesn't sell, they won't allow it because they need to make their return on an investment. I mean, you know, and capitalism is capitalism. You want to, you know, open a business to sell things to make money. But right. But there's also a labor of love with it, too. You want to do you want to do what you want to do as a brewer. Yeah, you'll give the public what they want, but you should be able to have the freedom to explore the other things. And I think craft beer is in danger of, and in some ways already has, in some sectors, lost its true artisanal quality. Right. You know, and it's in danger of becoming the product that it was a reaction against in the first place. It's interesting. It's a very well thought out argument, Wayne. I'm proud of you. This is what happens when you take the microphone away from him for a month. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> in, in real time, it's been about a month since we recorded. So it's, uh, it feels good to get back in the flow of it. But anyway. And it feels great to be here at Columbia Isn't Cutworks. It's nice of them applauding us. It was. I know. I know. It's our triumphant return. We're back. Thank you. Hi. It's fine. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it is very nice to be here at uh, Columbia Kettleworks, And I am ashamed that this is my, my first time. But I'm glad it could be a very festive night with live music and, and great beers, I'm sure, ahead of us. Um, now, how long has Columbia Kettleworks been in existence? Uh, we, we celebrated our second year anniversary in May. Okay. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, has it been uh, this incarnation from the beginning? Like this same building, the same atmosphere? Is this what you guys set out for? Pretty much the way you see, the way it looks is the same. We've grown production-wise, but it's right. hard to tell from this view. Right. Yeah, and we were, you guys were nice enough to take us on a little tour. I know you guys are expanding soon. We'll, we'll get into a little bit of that. But uh, I, I feel like the, the extra real estate you guys will have will do well. There's, it's pretty crowded in here tonight. I mean, there's 
I don't think I see an empty table from my point of view, so that's great. I would imagine the demand is pretty high. Now, you guys were the first brewery in Colombia, right? Not historically. Well, I mean, yeah, for, I mean for, our, for modern times. Yeah. yeah, that's correct, yes. Okay. Very cool. How has the reception been so far? Uh, town's been absolutely wonderful. Uh, yeah, well received. We have locals that are just diehards. Uh, a lot of people travel a distance to get here. Uh, but all in all, I mean, the town's been great. It's been really good, a good experience. So why did you make the choice to open a brewery in Columbia? <laughs> <laughs> I love when we, We've laughs. never been asked that question before. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a first. We're going to have to think about that. Uh, I, I, well, when we were looking around for a place to open a brewery, Columbia was not a place we were thinking about, but um, we, we actually were just looking for buildings, and we saw a building in Columbia, and we thought we would go take a look at it. We went and we took a look at it, and we thought, ah, eh, it's not a bad place, maybe we'll consider it, and that person took us from that building to this building, which he owned, and we looked at this building and went, oh, this looks pretty good, but we don't know much about Columbia. We started doing some research, and for a variety of reasons, it started to sound pretty good, and the long run... We were thinking of moving into Lancaster, and we were getting close to considering that seriously, but the person who owned this building did everything he could to get us to put this place in this building, and he got his way eventually. He made us an offer we couldn't refuse, and that's how we ended up here. Because you originally wanted a place that was close to where you live, correct? Yeah, So yeah. how far is this from where you both live? Uh, well, both Bill and I, uh, we're about 30, a good 30 minutes away. So, yeah, originally we were trying to find something close to home uh, just because we both were, you know, working our day jobs. And uh, so this was a night night and weekend kind of gig for us. But, uh, it, you know, it, it's really it's difficult to find the perfect situation, a building, uh, you know, a landlord that's willing to work with you, uh, the township, everything. So uh, there, there's a whole host of reasons why we ended up in Columbia, but after we did, I mean, it's been a great experience, and uh, I'm really glad we're here. Thank you, thank you. And they're glad you're here, too. Yeah, yes, they, they like that. <laughs> How often do you guys do the live music? Uh, typically, we have live music pretty much every Saturday night, every once in a while on a Friday, uh, but typically it's every Saturday night. Do you guys do other sorts of events here? Do you ever do like beer dinners or anything like that? Uh, we've done anything from uh, oyster festivals to uh, uh, cigar fests where we bring somebody in and they actually hand roll uh, cigars right here at our facility. So it's Dan's like going to come back for that city. one. The only yeah. time, we're, oh my gosh, our grandfather. <laughs> yeah. When I He used to live in Naples, Florida. And he's a, a diehard Budweiser drinker, like through and through. So whenever I would go down to visit him, I would always take him to a few craft breweries to try to get him to try other beers. And I took him to Cigar City. And we literally were sitting on the end of the bar, and the woman is there making Cuban cigars right next to him. Yep. He was in heaven. Yep. <laughs> he's like, Steffi, this is the best. So he's drinking. He was probably drinking a Pilsner and having rolled cigars right there was... Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, actually, so next time he's in Pennsylvania, we'll have to bring him here. Yeah, we, we were actually just talking, I think, today about when's the next time we're going to have the cigar event. It was a big, it was definitely a big hit. Yeah. So cool. Not That's something not many people are doing. Yeah, it's, it's unique, yeah. It's not something you see a lot of. I mean, bands you expect at breweries, you know, special food things, special tap takeovers or whatever, yeah. but uh, that's pretty so unique. It, if cool. you've got somebody hand-rolling them, do you have, like, beers that you would pair with the cigars or have, like, recommendations? Uh, I think the last time that we did the cigar event, uh, we actually had a smoked porter Ooh. on tap, uh, which just sounded good. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure what kind of beer doesn't go good with a with a good Cuban cigar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very nice. So, Rod, when you guys first opened, you were the one doing the brewing, correct? Yes. Uh, yeah, when we first opened, uh, I was doing all the brewing for about the first maybe year. Uh, I'm also still employed, so I still have a day job. So it was uh, a lot of long hours, uh, you know, long weeks. Uh, and then we made the decision to bring uh, Chad aboard. Well, actually, a decision to bring somebody else aboard. And we uh, kind of looked a little bit, and uh, I uh, gave Chad some hints that he eventually took. And uh, Ask my wife. I'm bad at hints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
he, he eventually said, hmm, maybe, uh, maybe I could seek employment at your place. And we said, okay. And now we have him shackled and chained. And, <laughs> and, You're uh, not going anywhere. Yeah, he, he, he's actually given me my life back. So I still brew, uh, but Chad does the bulk of the brewing nowadays. Yep. When you're allowed in the brewery, you brew. When yes. Chad lets you in. Yeah, he, he allows me in every now and then on weekends. <laughs> <laughs> so what attracted you to Columbia Kettle Works? What brought you here? Um, well, it's close to home. You know, when I was working in Iron Hill, I had to do some commuting. You know, the home base there for Iron Hill is in Wilmington, Delaware. So I ended up driving down there probably every six weeks. And uh, But all in all, you know... It, it wasn't so much the drive. Um, you know, for me, it was uh, the flexibility of scheduling, you know, the ability to be able to um, have the ability to come more often and, or, or be able to leave if I have to, you know, the young son at home. And so I would say all in all, it was, it was the flexibility. And, you know, I also wanted to be part of something from the beginning. Iron Hill is a great brewery and brew pub and very well established. And, um, you know, when I was a brewer there, I was, you know, I was, I was that. I was just a brewer. I wanted to be part of a company and be part of the fabric of it and, and get involved more. So this was my opportunity to get into a brewery from not so much the ground up because they were already established and successful, but early on. And Steph has a, a, a unique perspective on uh, your brewing uh, prowess because, well, I'll let Steph, tell the story. Should you want me to tell the story? There's no story. No, I, what, I, Chad was my mentor for six weeks at Iron Hill. And I made the joke when you're coming up the elevator, and that's why I don't work in a brewery. <laughs> <laughs> there was something about a pig as well. Yes, I heard something about a pig story that we're supposed to be told. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought oh. it was a goat. If you could hear those looks. Oh, he thought it was no, a it was a pig. It was definitely a pig. Okay, so what, what's, what's with the pig? Should we acknowledge the pig in the room? Go ahead, Chad. <laughs> yeah. You can tell that story. Uh, well, I think you should specify first by um, telling everybody your dietary preferences. Oh, I think they know. Everybody knows. Everybody listening to this She's a vegan except when she's diet. drunk and yeah. then she has cheese. Yeah. Okay. She's so, a vegetarian. Uh, let your mind wander already. <laughs> so uh, we decided, uh, the assistant brewer and I, who lived in my backyard, uh, we decided to roast a pig. Wait, what? That, that's a whole other story. Back up? Mike. Yeah, let's, let's back up to that. All right, let's He's back currently up. buried there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the home that I own has rental property in the back. Okay. And, All right. Uh, that makes a little more sense now. The assistant brewer's apartment burned down. And, uh, oh, jeez. We, we had a vacancy, so... It just worked out. So he moved in. Chad is also a part-time arsonist. <laughs> <laughs> Landlord, get a little brewer, lonely. arsonist. Hear me. He <laughs> so uh, the assistant brewer was living in the backyard at the time, and we decided <laughs> we uh, wanted to roast a pig. So, uh, you know, the logistics of buying a whole pig and doing it, you know, it's a lot of work. Uh, it was around the 4th of July. Steph was, of course, interning with us, and... Um, we had a situation where we had to go to the farm, pick up the pig, who had recently been butchered. But we needed a cold place to store it until we did the deed. So uh, we, what's the what's the coldest place in a brewery to store a large group of meat? Uh, I'm going to go with mash tun. Cold box. Cold box. Cold box. <laughs> so we laid the eviscerated pig on the uh, kegs and... Uh, <laughs> Send stuff in to do the inventory. Oh, uh, that's amazing! <laughs> it, it was, oh, it, and honestly, oh. I, I guess I was just being insensitive. I hadn't really thought, you know, how that would affect her. I can, I can see the PTSD <laughs> on her face. <laughs> Pig traumatic stress disorder. Yep. Pig traumatic, pretty much. Is but that, I wasn't gonna wuss out and whine about it. I, I mean, I first just, of all, I'm a girl in a brewery. I had to prove myself. So. I just wish that I could have. I just wouldn't touch it. I wish I could have seen your we didn't initial ask reaction. You to touch it. No, I know. I. Why? My question is, did you put the pig down in the inventory? One pig. Yeah. One, one yeah. spleen. Well, it wasn't owned by Two Iron Hill, so no. It was owned by Chad and Mike. Yeah. <laughs> However, if you go to a Costco in Seattle, they have carcasses hanging in their meat section there that you can buy carcasses. Like goats, pigs. I don't think they had cows. That would be a little big. Wow. So, of course, that's the first thing I thought of as we're walking through the Costco <laughs> in Seattle is, the oh, pig carcass. Chad and Mike should come here. Yeah. <laughs> I think that pretty much wrapped that story up. Uh, thanks for that. 
was good. I feel better for knowing that happened. <laughs> you guys never told you that story? No. I, I've never heard that story before. No. I'm surprised. I think actually. I've tried to block it out. I think you did. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wish I could have at least seen your reaction or at least heard your thoughts as you realized what was going on. She, she looked falsely confident and a little <laughs> ill. Oh, it's just, it's just That's why you let me put peppers in a beer. Exactly. Uh, I, I, I would like to go on record to say that we have no dead carcasses in our cold box. <laughs> that you we, know we of. We can vouch yes. for that. We were just down Pig there. Pig or so. otherwise. <laughs> that you know of. <laughs> there are Speaking cavities in the walls. the cold box downstairs, you guys are doing quite a bit of expansion right now. So while we still have Bill at the table and he hasn't tried to escape yet, do you guys want to talk about <laughs> the expansion here and how you're rapidly growing? Well, we... Um, we originally were thinking of moving down into the basement and putting a second bar down there, but there were some code issues that caused us to backtrack from that. Um, we now have the opportunity to move horizontally on the same floor that we're in, so we're moving into another space on this floor where we'll have approximately seating for 40 more people over in that area. So and we're changing it a little bit. It'll, it'll look this way as far as the look inside, but we'll probably actually cave and maybe put a TV in there and uh, some games and things like that and a lounge area as well. When do you expect that area to be open? Well, I hope it's between four to six weeks from now. Wow, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. soon. Yeah, yeah. Turn around. yeah, actually, this block wall that we're kind of seated against, uh, that's going to get knocked out on Monday. Wow. Oh, wow. So it'll be one large space instead of yes, two separate spaces. That's correct, yes. And there's some expansion going on downstairs as well in the brewery, well, in the fermentation space. Yeah, yep. We uh, we have been expanding our fermentation space down there, and uh, right now uh, our motivation is more of a barrel program. Uh, so we have been doing a lot of things in bourbon barrels and uh, wine barrels and what have you. Uh, but we're looking to grow that part of the business. So we'll be doing a lot more barrel aging, uh, and we're going to start dabbling in the sours. And there's a Flanders down there in barrels right now? There is. One that was brewed back in uh, January, and uh, kind of seems like, I'd say, probably around this January, coming January, uh, it should be ready to go. Uh, but it's coming along just, just very well. We were yep. pleasantly surprised. So we're talking about expansion, but as of uh, right now, what what uh, what size system do you have? How much fermentation capacity do you have right now? Uh, so we brew on a five barrel system. Uh, we have four ten barrel fermenters, ten barrel bright tank, and a five barrel bright. So uh, we're a five barrel brewery, but we uh, we double batch here and there, and uh, and we we have a cold box upstairs, cold box downstairs. So we got plenty of uh, cold storage. Uh, probably around, I don't know, we keg everything, so we probably got around 100, maybe 120 kegs uh, all together. Usually in a, in a four-week period, I'm usually brewing six times. Six times in four weeks? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, that's pretty good. And uh, how many yeah. uh, taps do you generally have on? Uh, we typically have at least 11 beers on tap. Uh, it fluctuates. Some some weeks is 10, you know, but but we, we try to keep all 11 taps filled. Um like and Chad said, we you know we uh, like like this coming week is actually a busy week. Chad's brewing twice, I'm brewing once, so this is you know sometimes it's once a week, sometimes it's two or three times a week. And of those eleven taps, how many of them are flagship beers or staple beers that you always have on, and how many are more rotational? Uh, I would consider all of them rotational. I, I wouldn't say that we have any real flagships, although our Pilsner uh, is generally on tap. Um, and we have a few other fa- fan favorites that we bring back from time to time, but uh, we're constantly trying to uh, do new recipes, try different things. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily consider much much of anything really flagships. But generally, if you come back, from month to month, at least half the beers will be different. That's always good. Have something different to try whenever you come in. Exactly. Nice variety. Yeah. Do you guys um, gravitate towards any sort of styles, or do you kind of brew? All pepper beers. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. Everything. Yeah. If, if Steph owned the place, it would all be pepper beers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say there's any one particular variety. Uh, since... Uh, since our upgrade downstairs to uh, jacketed tanks, uh, that that allowed us to get into uh, the lager categories, which we couldn't really do a proper lager before, so we, we didn't even attempt it. But 
but now uh, we're able to do some great loggers and, and actually Chad uh, that's his domain I stay out of loggers I don't want anything to do with them <laughs> Chad is Mr. Logger guy so. <laughs> Mr. Logger guy I, like <laughs> I, I would think in general I've, as a brewer I have a propensity to brew traditional beers you know nice. uh, which has been you know coming on board here to CKW it's been such a learning experience because Rod is constantly challenging me to use new and different ingredients and um, my go to as a brewer is just to brew what I know. Right. And so uh, I don't think that's necessarily right. So uh, but when it comes to lagers, usually traditional is best. So it's true, yes. Yeah. It tends to be the wheelhouse. Don't mess with a good thing. Exactly. <laughs> don't put habaneros in a pills. No, yeah. I prefer them in a Ralph beer. Yeah. That makes more sense. A little yeah, a little bit. <laughs> what's the uh, what's the strangest beer that you've done here? Or I guess out of left field, if there's any strange ones you can pick out. Oh. Whoa. I think you stumped them. Or stumped. <laughs> do you guys do, like, crazy... Like, even, like, batch, like, out there, batch like beers, experimental batches? Do you batches? do, like, any firkin stuff like that? Or you pretty much stick to I mean, just good beer? I'm not sh- sure what I would consider crazy. Uh, I mean, you, we you smoked just, pumpkins. That was cool. You yeah, pumpkins. yeah. I mean, we've, uh, we've smoked pumpkins. And, and like, pumpkin. our pumpkin beer has actual pumpkin in it. I mean, we, we actually smoke pumpkins, use the smoked pumpkins in a beer, right into mash. Um, but, I mean, we've, like, just this week, uh, Chad brewed a, an IPA uh, with rice, Japanese hops. He's going to dry hop it with lemongrass. Uh, oh, you guys were telling us about that one yeah. when we were downstairs. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know if you consider that crazy. Uh, it sounds delicious. I think, yeah, it does sound delicious. I think it's, yeah. it's yeah. a little left of center because don't, you don't really get many people using lemongrass or anything like that in it. So, I, I, I can appreciate the uniqueness of that. And you could, I mean, there's definitely, talking about considering crazy, there's definitely a line you can cross. Right. Like, there's putting stuff in beer that will make a good beer, and there's putting stuff in beer that will get people to write about it on the internet. Sure. You know? Speaking of, I picked up a bottle of the beer that had the stuff that was on the moon. Oh, my God. Oh, really? Really? I got it at the Costco in Seattle. So, a lot of exciting things happen here at CKW. Uh, but I I feel like I, I want to try another beer besides the Heffy that Wayne had. Should we beer? We should beer. Let's beer. Let's beer. Beer me! Beer me! Beer me! Beer me! There's a uh, tall glass in front of each of us with a very delicious looking beverage. And I'm very... I'm going to bust out the E-word. I'm excited about this one because I've had a title in mind for an episode for two years that I finally get to use today. Is this the first Schwartz beer we've had on air? I believe it's the first Schwartz and beer we've had on And I know what the title's going to be. Of course. You of guys course are long you do. overdue. Uh-oh. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I'm just going to, before we even talk about this beer any further, because I already took a sip, this is fucking delicious. It's amazing. Yeah, it it's really it's good. <laughs> or as Martin Virgo would say, it's amazeballs. Amazeballs. It's amazeballs. Well, on that note, why don't you yes. tell us a little yeah, bit about Yeah, there was a very long description that was on here, but I feel like instead of us reading it, let's find out about it from the man himself, the men themselves. What's what's the story behind this one? All right, so we're calling this Kohlenbacher Export, and uh, that's not a name that I came up with, nor the recipe. Uh, this recipe hails from at least 125 years ago, and... Uh, my family way back when, when they owned a brewery in Lancaster City, this was one of the four products that they branded and sold. And they branded it as the Kohlenbacher Export. And uh, much like a Dortmund Export or uh, any other beer style that ri- hails from a city, uh, Kohlenbach in Germany was known for its uh, dark black lagers. This is incredible. <laughs> it is. It, this. I mean, I could see why this is a, a, a recipe that's, you know, over 100 years old. I mean... Don't mess with a good thing. This is perfect. This is this is the perfect like flavorful, malty, dark, traditional yeah. German. I want to drink this in Pennsylvania, you know, and then maybe a lager and a pilsner. But then I'm going to have another one of these. Yeah. <laughs> it's a deceptive beer, you know. If done correctly, you want to uh, almost close your eyes and not know it's dark, you know. But just very like you know, it's black in color, but it's got very subtle acrid burnt notes you know you really want those to be subtle right yeah yeah that is and there is a like a a a tinge of a roasty quality there and it's not super sweet but it's got a nice nice slight malty sweetness to it and it it smells amazing i think i I just want to drink a lot of it yeah it's it's really good you need to buy liter glasses (laughs) steins i want a moss of this can i tell the story on how i found the recipe Please. please please do okay so uh 
Uh, when I was like six or seven, my grandmother sold a majority of the uh, Ricker Brewery artifacts to um, you know other people who collected them. Obviously, I was too young to put in my vote for it. So uh, fast forward to my early 20s, uh, my wife and I were at a um, local flea market. It's called Shup's Grove. It's like an outdoor flea market. And in the fall, they have um, themed weekends, so they'll do transportation, and they'll be selling oil cans and gas cans and that sort of thing. Well, one of their themed weekends is called Tobacco and Tavern. So as you would expect, there would be uh, cigar boxes and a lot of Bruania. And, uh, you know, so I was walking around, and I always had an eye out for Ricker stuff. You know, anything. I'll take bottles, I'll take labels, whatever I can get back that had recently been, that had been sold when I was a child. And I uh, was walking around, it was towards the end of the day, hadn't found anything, which I wasn't surprised. And I uh, spoke to one lady who had a stand, and I just said to her, my mission, you know, I was looking for my family's lost artifacts. And she said, well, I've got a folder here of documents. I don't know who they belong to, but I was told they were local. And when I opened them up, it was ledgers, recipes, all of it from my family's brewery. Uh, my great-grandfather's income, all of his employees, who he fired, who he hired, like all of it. And in there was the four original recipes for the four products. So uh, after I picked myself up off the ground, <laughs> put all the documents back together again, I... Uh, <laughs> he, offered, he offered her like a dollar. I paid five. Oh, five five <laughs> no dollars. I paid five. Wow. wow. That, I mean, that, that is... That's like a movie. That is like a, 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 the, the quest. My favorite part was... Were you uh, searching for my family's lost artifacts? It's just like, that's so awesome. <laughs> that is the coolest thing. Um, uh, yeah, it was, it was awesome. It was only an uphill journey from there. Uh, you know, a lot of them were in German or used archaic, antiquated terms that we don't use in the brewing industry anymore. So I had to do a ton of research and deciphering um, on all the little ingredients to be able to rebrew it. You know, right, because right. a lot of the stuff that went into this beer. 125 years ago isn't called that anymore, or exists in another form. Were despite the, uh, how like old measurements beers. different as well. Yeah, they're all they're all metric. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was uh, a lot of research. Then once I was able to convert it to our American vernacular, it's much easier to rebrew now. Wow. What what kind of emotions were running through your head the first time you brewed this recipe? Pride. Good. Okay. Yeah, real With proud. the tinge of, I better not fuck this up. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Otherwise, my, the ghost of my great-great-grandfather will <laughs> haunt me. Yes. Uh, no, it's a, a ton of pride. I, I feel very proud to be able to be a professional brewer, working for a great company and a great bunch of bosses, and being able to brew in the town I grew up in, where the family started. I mean, it's it's. I feel so blessed to be able to do that. That's uh, great. Yeah, very thankful. Yeah, we don't get many stories like that. It's, no, that, I was just it's say, that is one of the it's best brewing stories we've yeah. ever had on the podcast. That's yeah. really awesome. So those the four recipes. What were what were the beers? So it was a German Pils, okay, Schwartz beer, Schwartz which you're drinking now. Right. Uh, it was a Vienna Lager. Okay. All those three beers shouldn't surprise you right. guys. German immigrant yeah. bringing those over, uh, and then um, an English pale ale to please the angry Brits. Right. Right. <laughs> nice. Nice. And did you did you brew? All of the recipes? You've only done a Schwartz Yeah, beer. so I only did a Schwartz beer. Uh, my previous job being a head brewer at Iron Hill, we brewed this beer, and um, they already had a Vienna as a house beer. Right. So it wasn't too novel. And Pils, we brewed all the time, just right. like here. So, And, you know, the difference between uh, a Pils from 125 years ago and now is nominal. Right, There's not much. Schwartz beer was interesting because it is kind of, a, I wouldn't call it a dead style. You know, it's not like Berliner where it's making a resurgence, but you just don't see a lot of craft breweries brewing Schwartz beers. I could be wrong. Maybe there are. No, it I just do, feels that way. I've come across a lot of, uh, of craft breweries uh, in Pennsylvania, given the German heritage, right, right. that are going back to those sort of tradition, traditional German styles, and particularly lager styles. But they don't styles. taste like this. But this, I mean, yeah, this particular style, and this, I mean, I'm blown away. This beer is really, really good. <laughs> this is something I could... I could imagine being on tap at Brauhaus Schmitz. Hey, definitely, yeah. Living up to that style, this is something Beate would be proud of definitely. to have in her bar. One of my favorite photos from the family was uh, my great 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 grandfather standing in the tavern. He's got a big glass mug, and you can see even in black and white, it's black beer. I mean, he's just <laughs> a liter of black beer. I'm sure he would be proud if he was sitting here drinking this today. I, ho- I hope. It's wow. delicious. And so, how lucky are you, Rod, having not only such a gifted and, and talented brewer here, but to have these stories and this history. And it just seems like this was meant to be, this 
this match. Yeah, it, actually, it, it was funny. So Chad and I knew each other a little bit, and uh, uh, when we decided to bring Chad aboard, uh, I actually found out after we hired him that he has, you know, he's a sixth generation brewer and a whole history and. I'm like, why did you not lead off the interview? With <laughs> no, that? that should like, be like, his, like, really his buried resume. The lead there. Yeah. Sixth generation yeah, brewery. Like, like, oh, and by the way, I have these 120 year old recipes that have been in my <laughs> yeah, family. Like, I have hire me because of my dead old. relatives. Short, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's like you should have led off with that. But uh, I feel like I got them cheap. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> We're going to have to have a talk after this. <laughs> this is when he asked for a race. Yes. <laughs> Actually, I have a meeting to talk to. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, obviously, the day you found those recipes and all those documents and paid a whole $5 for them for this invaluable piece of your family history. Um, but beyond that, have you amassed a collection of your family's lost artifacts? I, I attempt to. It's all really expensive. Yeah. Uh, as it turns out, in local brewery collecting, Ricker paraphernalia is the most expensive. Uh, oh, really? Because of our... Back then, our reputation was huge. So now that is translated to um, high prices in terms of its rarity. Right. It's, it's really sought after. Uh, so I can only afford so much. Uh, I try to go to the auctions locally when I see them come up. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of things, even something as simple as a Ricker tap for like a, a beer tap, uh, three or four hundred dollars. You know, it gets it gets pricey really quick. So. Wow. Uh, and it doesn't, you know, auctions don't happen often. You know, you have some old guy collecting a bunch of beer, Berania passes away. The family auctions it off. That happens, yeah. what, every 10 years? Yeah, and people um, collect that sort of thing. If the price it, is right, like, yeah, it can yeah, happen more. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Although, ha- have you ever used your, your family connection? It's like, like, hey, come on. Like, this is, you know. Uh, yeah, not too cut much. Cut me a little I'm, break here, so. Yeah, I mean, I feel bad. You know, like I, I can think of local guys that have certainly brought me into their home and said, "This is my collection. These are your family's art items. Mm-hmm. You may hold them, but it's not like <laughs> give them back." You know, at the end of you know, right? Yeah. And they they worked hard and they paid honest money. Yeah. for them. You know, are they rightfully mine? I don't know. I wish they were. I can't afford them. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you need to start taking an advantage. I mean, he's kind of an artifact too. You need to sell this idea of hey, this is the you know the sixth generation brewer. Well, what what this, what's important is uh, so my son is the last male of the tree branch. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if he does not have a male, the name will die. Oh wow! My brother has a daughter, and my cousin and his wife currently don't have a child. So. The pressure is on Scotty See. at the moment. No pressure, Scotty. No pressure, man. It's no pressure, not too late to have males, however, in the current situation. It's looking like that might be the like case. It's like Game of Thrones type shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You will pass, pass on all the, the documents and artifacts yeah. to your son and say, you must carry this legacy forward. Oh yeah. Wow. He'll be brewing for us in like two years. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be eight. <laughs> Once he's tall enough to reach most most everything. As soon as he can reach the top of the mash ton. Yeah, we're, we're, we're putting him to work. Boom. Yep. First assistant brewer. Yeah. If he can pick up a 50-pound sack, we're good. Good to go. Does he weigh 50 pounds yet? <laughs> he, he barely breaks 40. Wow. Yeah. It's all about the leverage. Yeah. Gotta use the legs. Yeah. Scotty, use your back. Yeah. <laughs> this is... Seven generations of brewing history yeah. behind you. You can lift that bag of grain. <laughs> I just want to play Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> this beer is phenomenal. It's good, and like, glad you enjoy it. Cheesy to say, but you can taste the history in this. Like it's, it. All right, it was really cheesy to say. I'm sorry, <laughs> but but it is like it, it has what I love about like uh, uh, the traditional German styles done in the traditional way is that they just there's. There's a character to it that goes past like how it smells and how it tastes. It just has this authenticity and timelessness to it, and this is this fits perfectly into that car- category. It, it's, it was cool when um, Dogfish had worked with Penn and brewed some of those old oh, King yeah. Midas's Touch, yeah, right, the yeah. Nails. You know the, the H and Nails. That was a cool, cool series of beers. Yeah. Uh, you know, much older. You know, this yeah. is only 125 years old. Those were like 2,000 year old recipes. Although to be fair, I mean. Ancient beer, I'm sure a lot of it actually sucked. 
be, beer from you know a hundred to five hundred years ago from Germany was probably the apex of yeah. <laughs> the development of the craft. They were probably pumped when it was infected. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did something. Something happened. <laughs> Skim the foam off the top. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to finish this all now, but I feel like uh, since I still have some of my glass, let's uh, make Wayne do some work. Are we doing a thing? We should do a thing. Wayne, what uh, what do we got uh, on tap, as it were? What do we got on tap? <laughs> Cheers, Internet, and welcome to Happy Fun Time Games, the only podcast trivia segment that is more fun than a dead pig in a cold box. <laughs> <laughs> Today, <Nice. laughs> we return to uh, one of my top two or three favorite uh, Happy Fun Time Games. This is Band or Beer. The uh, red-headed stepchild of libation or fabrication in which I will give you the name of something and you must tell me whether that thing is the name of a band or the name of a beer. And we will begin in time-honored tradition to my left with Dan and the first name of the game today is Wake Up Dead. Is that a band or a beer? Uh, I'm going to say it sounds like a band... And it sounds like a death metal band. All right, Dan is saying not just a band, but specifically a death metal band. As Steph throws up the horns. Oh, the horns Rock and are, roll. Uh, sign of the beast. Chad, what do you think? I'm going to go with both. No, I'm just kidding. You that's not allowed. <laughs> uh, that is... Your answer cannot be in a quantum state. <laughs> a beer. All right, saying it's a beer. Moving over to Rod. What do you think? Uh, wake up dead. Wake up dead. I'm going to have to say beer. going to have to say beer. And finally, Steph. I'm going to say band. Steph is going to say band. My fellow beer busters are incorrect. Ah, damn it. Ah. Because it is, in fact, a beer. It is a uh, Russian Imperial Stout by Left Hand Brewing out of Colorado. It's smooth warming stout with malt flavors of raisins, licorice, coffee, and dark chocolate. Good morning. You've woken up dead. You're in ruins, but don't be discouraged. Here's a black ale to brighten your day. Not a band, but it is, in fact, a song, as well as a beer. It is a song by Megadeth. Of course it is. So, you know, you were no, you were in the ballpark. Now. No subtle. Thrash metal. Thrash metal. All right. Yes. One Columbia kettle works. <laughs> After this game, we need to ask Rod uh, his unfair advantage in this game, only because he has musical roots. Uh, yeah, but you, yeah, you, yeah, have, you have brewing roots and the other half of it's beer, so. <laughs> I'm a sixth generation failed musician. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time honored tradition. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to our next one, and Chad's going to guess first on this one, and this is Angry Salad. Is that a band or a beer? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a preference. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with band. Chad is saying that that is a band. Rod, what do you think? Band or beer? Uh, Invoke I, I, that history. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping it's a, uh, a band. All right, saying it's a band. Well, using since the power they said beat. band, I'm going to say beer. Uh-oh. Steph is going to buck the trend and say beer. And finally, Dan? Uh, run it by me one more time. I found a spider, and I lost all concentration. I've been watching it, too. Oh, wow. I think it's outside. I sure hope so, because yeah. it needs to stay outside. It's fairly sizable. Yeah. Yeah. Angry Salad. Band or beer? Angry Spider. Angry Salad. Angry Salad. Angry Salad. Uh, Angry salad. Band. Dan is saying it's a band. Steph, you are the only one who was wrong. Uh. Because it is, in fact, a band. Angry Salad was not a band anymore. It was a band, an alternative rock band from Boston, Massachusetts, that formed in 1993. In 1998, they secured a deal with Blackbird Atlantic and re-released their pre-label album Bizarre Gardening Accident as a self-titled <laughs> album in 1999. Uh, the band was in the process of recording demos for their next Atlantic release when AOL and Time Warner merged and their Blackbird label was closed for financial reasons. Angry Cell lost the rights to their band name, their music, and all their albums. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so it's sad. kind of shitty. Wow. Um, but their recording of the Bob Dylan song, My Back Pages, was used as the theme song for the short-lived WB Network series DC, and their original song, Stretch Armstrong, was used in the pilot of an online sitcom series called Family Practice. So there you go. I feel like when Steph went home after she saw the dead pig in the coal box, <laughs> she had an <laughs> angry sound. <laughs> <salad. laughs> Probably. Probably. I think Steph's had a lot of angry salads in her day. <laughs> 
<laughs> Moving on. And well, Rod I don't, don't want to know guess. what that means. Rod is going <laughs> to guess first. So let's move on. All right. uh, the next one is Skull Crushing Ape. Is that a band or a beer? Oh, it's totally a beer. Totally a beer. Totally a beer. Saying, Rod, Steph, what do you think? Well, I'm going to stop my plan, and I'm just going to say whatever they say. Beer. All right. Well, that plan's not going to work on the next one, because you're guessing first on the next oh, one. Shit. Dan, what do you think? <laughs> Skull Crushing Ape. Is that a band or a beer? I'm going to say beer. Dan is saying that that is a beer. And finally, Chad. That is a beer, and I would fear the hangover. <laughs> and you would fear the hangover. <laughs> everyone said that beer. That should be the tagline. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone is correct. It is, in fact, a beer. You stop to wipe your brow and peer up at the peaks of the Bavarian Alps. You've been tracking the mythical great ape through these mountains for days. Your mind flickers to the strong black ale in your rucksack. A mixture of three brewing styles from Germany, Schwartz, Weizen, and Doppelbach. You retrieve the bottle and take a pull to steal your nerves as the ape bellows in the distance. The beer rolls over your tongue, smooth with notes of chocolate and intense punch, and leaving ever the faintest hint of banana on your lips. It's an 8%. Schwartz Weizen Doppelbach Hybrid from Devil De- did, Devil's Backbone Brewing. Did you say banana on your lips? Yes, I did say banana on your lips. All right. <laughs> Which bonus point is the name of a band? No, but it should be. It might be. I don't know. Wow, their their marketing director, great writer. That was an awesome description. Wasn't it though? That was that was gripping. That was. Uh, they definitely paid attention in creative writing in college. <laughs> yeah, I was on the edge of my seat. All right, moving on to Steph, who's going to guess first on this one, and this is Harvester of Sorrow. Is that a band or a beer? I know the answer, no pressure. <laughs> Too bad he's going to guess last. Band. Steph is saying that's a band. Moving over to Dan. Uh, beer. Dan is saying a uh, beer. That is Chad. a band on my iPod. That is a band on your iPod. Correct. All right, is a band on your iPod, and finally, Rod? I think I heard Chad's iPod, so I'm saying band. You're saying band as well. Okay. This stuff already guessed. My notes are a little out of order here. All right, well, it's a beer. No! no! <laughs> but is it really a band on your iPod? I swear, I'm going to go get it. Yeah. Google. Dan, get your we, finger ready. I think we might have to have uh, some judgment going here, because if it is a band, then everybody's right. Have you heard that band? Haven't you heard that band? I feel like I did. All right, we're going to pause what a moment and consult the internet. Harvester of Sorrow. I will tell you before you start Googling, it is a song. That is Metallica, right? By Metallica. Okay, I might be actually thinking of that. Okay. Uh. It is from the Injustice for All album. If it is also a band, then everybody is right. If it is not also a band, then only Dan is right. So no matter what, I'm right. No matter what, you're Everything right. Everything that comes up is Metallica. That's probably what I was thinking. Yep, song by Metallica. Damn it. Uh, yep. I blame his iPod. <laughs> I should have specified a song. That doesn't count. That's not one of the options. I, uh, we'll have to go back. I think I said it was on my iPod. No, you said that is a band Damn on it. my iPod. Yeah. This has all no. been recorded. I You're probably right. I kind of what we've I can't been doing. Live rewind the tape. Wait, what? We're recording this? This isn't just some <laughs> exercise? <laughs> we're, not, we're not just talking with headphones. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is team building. This thing isn't even plugged it in. It is the name oh. of a cover band. Oh. Oh. Steph, you bailed me out again. Technicality. Is it a Metallica cover band? Probably, yeah. yes. All right, well, okay, since there's so much confusion, everyone gets a point for that one. Woo! Uh, but the beer, Harvester of Sorrow, is a Cabernet Barrel Aged Saison from Three Stars Brewing in Washington, D.C., which sounds delicious. Uh, they say the oak from the Cabernet Wine Barrel contributes flavors reminiscent of pineapples, coconut, passion fruit, and mangoes. It is soft and almost creamy mouthfeel, followed by a nice, dry, though slightly tart finish. And as we mentioned pre- previously, it is also a song by Metallica from the album And Justice for All. Moving on to our final name of the game. Oh, I thought that was the last one. That would have been. Well, I have five questions because there was potentially going to be five people playing. But Bill ran but away. But since Bill ran away, yeah. we're still going to do the fifth question. And I'm going to randomly choose Steph to go first hey! on this one. Whoa! <laughs> And this last one. I think one, you should go first. The last one is Computer Jesus Refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> and a band or a beer. That has to be a band. What? Step <laughs> saying it has to be a band. Compu- what? Computer mm-hmm. Jesus Refrigerator. It sounds like something with Tourette's would yell out. <laughs> <laughs> or a tired Dan's beer. Oh. <laughs> oh. I'm going to say band. Dan is going to say band. Chad, what do you think? 
Uh, I'm going to go band. Going to go band as well. And finally, Rod. I'm hopeful it's a band. Hopeful it's a band. Everybody's saying band. Everybody is correct because it is, in fact, a band either from Austin, San Antonio, or Antarctica. Computer Jesus <laughs> Refrigerator is a glitch slash noise band, which is, I suppose, a genre of music? With a question mark? Uh, they mostly sound like a Klingon video game throwing a temper tantrum while a dial-up <laughs> modem has a seizure in the background, but they call it music. CJR, for short, is mostly the work of one dude named Michael Vasquez who goes by the name of Coco Freak Bean and makes bizarre little videos for Funny or Die, such as one entitled, Plinter Number 11, Poop Sex Gone Bad. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 not a beer. Wait, what is this band uh, called again? Computer, Computer Jesus, Jesus Refrigerator. Oh, I'm yeah. gonna ask Dan to burn me that CD. <laughs> yeah. I know what we're calling our next IP. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Poop sex gone bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So Black we're adding idea. up the adding up the points real quick here, and uh, Team Columbia Kettleworks with a strong showing, a perfect score of five points each. Chad and Rod coming in. At a close uh, second slash third is Dan with four points. And trailing just behind that with three points is Steph. So joint winners today, though not quite bum, a bum, Durban bum, bum. sparkle wow. party. Sorry, I so did you say Steph's last place? Steph is in last place. Okay. Bum, bum, ba, dum. Wow. And if you're keeping score at home, Steph was in last place with three points. Bum, bum, ba, dum. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for playing. Don't forget to go to patreon.com slash beerbusters to support the podcast and get cool behind-the-scenes perks and be the envy of all your friends. Patreon.com slash beerbusters. After we just got done ragging on Steph, now it's now it's her turn to do something. No, 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 your beers. Steph, what do we got? The next beer we're tasting on the show is Chris Harvey's Mango Double IPA, which, of course, was dry hopped with Citroen Mosaic. And I was recently on BYO.com and came across an article on advanced dry hopping by Dave Green. So here is a brief overview of Green's advice to achieve hop bliss. The first piece of advice is to focus on minimizing oxygen uptake post-fermentation. The first potential culprit for oxygen ingression is from racking. To help you solve the racking dilemma, the first option is to rack as gently as possible, and if possible, rack before the yeast has finished primary fermentation. This will allow a new blanket of CO2 to develop after racking. The second option, if you have access to CO2, is to purge your receiving vessel with a shot of CO2. The third and best option is to keep the system closed altogether and basically make it impossible for oxygen to get introduced into the beer. So basically, oxygen is bad for beer. The next piece of advice is to use a device to deliver the dry hops in an oxygen-free system similar to a hop cannon or Sierra Nevada's hop torpedo. Hop cannon... Hop cannons shoot the pellets into the fermenter via CO2. The hop torpedo is an inline recirculation system that passes the finished beer through the dry hops before returning the beer back into the fermenter. Some believe these devices can be overkill on the homebrew scale, so you could instead vacuum pack the hops first and gas flush them with nitrogen or carbon dioxide. Another approach is to submerge the hops in cold sterile water, deaerated water if possible, and then transfer them to the beer. A different option is to rack the beer onto the dry hops while when there are still few, a few gravity points left to go until terminal gravity is reached because the active yeast will help to absorb some of the oxygen uptake that has occurred during transfer. Now what about timing? Green suggests eliminating as much yeast as possible from suspension before adding dry hops since yeast can strip hop oils from solution. Either rack your beer to secondary before adding dry hops or add dry hops only after adding a fining agent. Matt Brindelson of Firestone Walker, on the other hand, adds his hops during fermentation to take advantage of the active yeast for dissolved oxygen protection, natural mixing, which is believed to help in better extraction of wanted oils, and biotransformation of hop oil compounds. Now, how long? Most home brewers dry hop for as short as three days. Vinny of Russian River dry hops for five days. Research confirms that hop extraction occurs rapidly. In fact, in a recirculating system, most aroma compounds are extracted from pellet hops in a matter of hours. For pelletized dry hops added without recirculation, full extraction can occur in one to two days. 
The next variable to look at is temperature. Jack's Abbey Brewing's Jack Hendler, known for its IPLs, dries hops for an average of three to four days, increasing the temperature to 55 degrees. For adding hops, says that the cooler the temp, the less aroma you pull from the hops. You can get more advice on dry hopping your beers, discussion on whole hops versus pelletized hops, and a recipe for a rye IPL on BYO.com. And for a free issue of Brew Your Own Magazine, click on the red banner on BeerBustersPodcast.com. Can't be free. This was a very in-depth Know Your Beer, and I do appreciate that, but it's really showing me that I am far too stupid to brew. No. He, he actually drew a cannon. I did, yeah. That's on the notes, to show like you an actual reading. like Civil War you, cannon. You, you said hop cannon, and when I was reading it this morning, I drew a hop cannon. I don't think that would work. I'm going to try. Fun, though. When, when I do the Mr. Beer, I'm going to try that. Okay. All right. You still haven't made your Mr. Beer yet? Nope. Yeah, it's still sitting on top of the mini fridge. Okay, yep. I won your Mr. Beer dry hopped with a cannon. Okay. Nice. I can, I can do that. I can do that. And we'll have it on episode 754. I sense an ER visit coming up. <laughs> no, no. Urgent yeah. care. ER is too expensive. <laughs> well, I, like I said, I do appreciate the in-depth uh, Know Your Beer. But speaking of beer, um, several glasses at the table are in the process of being emptied or are empty. Beer me! Beer me! Beer me! Beer me! Round two, fight. So Chris Harvey found a way to be on the show, sort of, again. He, again. he always finds ways to be here without being here. Yeah. <laughs> well, shout he out does. to Chris. Yes, Good congratulations on winning, man. That's that's awesome. And just having had your stuff before, I, I can see why you'd won. But I don't think I've had this on, before. Wait, on winning what, Dan? The, the the thing that he won that I can't remember <laughs> at this so, point. Uh, so, so, Chad, why don't you tell us a little bit about this beer and how it came to be here at Columbia Kettle Works? Well, uh, Since we can't remember, obviously. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the competition has been uh, something that we've been doing now for four years with Mark Garber. Yep. You know, I started at Iron Hill where I wanted to develop some type of local homebrew competition. Naturally reached out to Mark Garber at Lancaster Homebrew. And uh, we've been doing this competition now. And uh, the idea was is it was going to be fully BJCP sanctioned. We'll pick winners. It'll be first, second, third uh, out of, what, 20 plus categories. Uh, however, the winning flight or the winning round uh, c- participating breweries, this year it was also Springhouse and Mad Chef. Uh, we were able to pick out of that pool a beer where we wanted to work with the brewer and brew the recipe on our scaled systems. Thanks. Thanks. And so, that's um, actually, despite our short memories, we talked about that when we recorded it. Yeah, Lancaster we did. Home yeah. And we drank a Columbia Kettle Orange beer yeah, on that did. episode. That's right. Yeah, yeah. we did. Yeah. We, we call the competition the uh, Iron Brewer. The Iron yes. Brewer, yep. yes. yes. Now I remember. See, we knew that. We knew all that. Yeah. 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 So you chose Chris as your favorite. Weren't correct. there three breweries that each chose their favorite? That's correct. Yeah, so it, out of all the people that actually won their categories... Uh, the three breweries got to sit down and actually choose their favorites out of those winners. So yeah, it takes you know, it, there's a lot to consider. You can't just pick some random beer hedonistically. You have to think about what your customers will enjoy because we have to sell 150 gallons of it. Yeah. You know, so we ha- our customers have to dig it. They have to buy in, and it can't be something that we already have on tap. You know, it'll cannibalize each other. So this was the perfect beer at the perfect time in the perfect place. It it all worked out. And Chris is a uh, really cool dude. Yes, yeah, we, uh, yeah we, we've known Chris for a while now doing the podcast. He was actually a guest on, a, uh, I think, episode earlier than 20. He was also our first phone He interview. was our first yeah, phone interview. Yeah, accidental phone interview that we found out we could do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, uh, so he's, he's been on the show quite a few times. So and this is, and um, uh, it's a shame he's not here to talk about it. Maybe you guys know. Um, I know he's brewed a mango IPA. I've had a mango IPA that he's brewed before, and it's always been really good. This is a double IPA. And this is much hoppier than I remember of uh, tasting his homebrews before. So I imagine he took that recipe and, and tweaked it a little bit. Yeah, this is uh, big time citra hops, big time mosaic, uh, 8.4% beer. Uh, so it's, it's a big beer. Uh, you know, a lot of homebrewers don't think about beer in this scale. But for commercial brewers listening, or, or if you want to do the math, uh, typically professional breweries think about beer in hops per pound. Right. So total amount of hops invested in the recipe from bittering to dry hop. Uh, for breweries like Russian River, where they use extracts, I'm not sure how exactly they figure out their poundage and when they report exactly how much they use. But 
generally speaking, American IPAs are one pound per barrel. Right. Okay? Uh, you can make a really killer double IPA, two pounds per barrel. Right. Rule, rule of thumb. This was 4.2 pounds per barrel. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, wow. this, this was off the chart. So, I mean, double, Computer double IPA. Jesus refrigerator. That's yeah. a lot of hops. <laughs> yeah. For our scale, I mean, it was it was pounds and pounds and pounds of hops. Yeah. And then, uh, like Chad said, we did about 150 gallons. Uh, uh, that's what we were shooting for, you know, when all the smoke cleared. Uh we used about 150 pounds of fresh mango, uh, and Chad really, really enjoyed implementing that mango into the bright tank. Uh, I hate the you, Chris. Of the mango. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, Chris Harvey is a good brewer, and he's also an asshole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah, um, so brewer and an asshole. It's a very good beer. Yeah, and for the barrage of in- the crowd loves it too, Chris. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, here's me. For the barrage of ingredients in there, the amount of hops and the amount of mango, it really is well balanced, yeah. and it's not nothing dominates too much. The mango is there up front, the hoppiness is there in the back, and it, it melds very well. I will say, uh, diving into it, the first sip, I was taken aback a bit. It was a lot. There was a lot really? of hot punch. See, for me, I coming didn't get in, a lot and of it. I had to like whoa for a minute. But then after the first sip, and you kind of acclimate to that 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 crazy hopness in your face. Um, it really starts to like the citrus starts to come through, the mango starts to come through, and after like I think I think you need to take like the first sips like jumping into an ice cold water, but once you're like used to it, when it's started, actually yeah. really nice, you know. You know what I like about this beer? It's not a hundred IBU. You know, there's plenty of great double IPAs out there that are hundred IBU. Uh, you know, you can push the boundaries in terms of bitterness, but I feel like this one's seventy. Yeah, the way he yeah, formulated it. Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, I thought you were going to say you loved the mango in it. Uh, well, I didn't. He like loved putting it. the mango, putting the mango in, it, in yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't like putting. The mango <laughs> in it. So, what was your dry hopping method? Did you use a cannon? <laughs> yes. We, Civil War era. Did, did you borrow it from Molly Pitcher? I hear they've got a, one. Yeah, uh, I inherited it. It was a bazooka. <laughs> <laughs> bazooka. <laughs> It's for the 21st century, for the modern yes. brewer. No, it was a drone. A drone. Yeah, yeah, we droned it to death. The hop drone. <laughs> As a professional brewer, I, um, in terms of oxygenation, I am very particular about oxygenating beers. And you remember brewing with me? I, uh, whenever beer moves from one tank to the other, I triple purge. Um, I spend a lot of time scrubbing oxygen uh, from finished beer. Um, it's something that helps me sleep better at night. Um, I've never actually used a DO meter on any of my beers, but um, I, I just take that extra precaution. So I agree. Oxygen is a no-go. Uh, but when I dry hop, I generally um, will do, um, for single IPAs, I'll do three days warm, three days cold. Uh, three days warm to, to get the full flavor out of the beer. Three days cold to flocculate the, the pellets. Um, but, uh, you know, Matt Bernelson, you mentioned him. Uh, you know, he was, before he became a pro brewer, he actually worked for the University of Wisconsin as a, um, like, a hop biologist. So I've never added hops to finished beer. I think that's a little crazy, but that guy knows his shit. So, you know, kudos to him for adding hops to finished be- or unfinished beer. Uh, but, you know, in general, uh, for double IPAs, I'll split the dry hop. So I'll add them in two infusions. So no cannon. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> So Sorry. short answer, no cannons. No cannons. It, it's all right. It's all right. I just summarized what he said. Hate to burst your bubble. <laughs> it's okay. It, it was burst before it even started. <laughs> this is quite good. And, and it's like I said, the more you drink it, the more drinkable it becomes. Like it tends, to, it, it seems to be going down easier. And, and I mean, this to sound yeah. negative. Like I don't want I know, this to come it, across. No, it, it, I know what you meant. But it, I know what you meant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just. For an eight whatever percent beer, it, it is. The more you drink it, it goes down much faster. Yeah, it does. And, it, and I think like the citrus flavor comes out and like you mentioned about the ibus only being around 70 is it's not it's a lot of hop flavor but, but it's not, not bracingly bitter not, yeah not right. super bitter i think no. had you made this had he formulated this beer to be like traditional dipa uh i think it would have distracted from the mango you yeah, know i don't think you would have gotten it at all yeah. it's yeah. a balance you have to be yeah. as a brewer you have to consider all the flavors going on yeah. although chris it would be good with some habaneros i'm just saying <laughs> salsa I'm, thing I'm going on yeah. i can I, I can get you a habanero pickle yeah. Oh, those habanero pickles are good. Yeah. Oh, I got I got garlic pickles with my with my sandwich earlier. Oh, the pick. Oh, who makes those pickles that you sell here? Uh, well, I don't know if I can really tell you that. 
So uh, th- there's there's <laughs> someone in Lancaster that actually makes all the pickles dynamite dill. Pickles. Oh, that's what I was asking. Yeah. The company. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but, uh, I don't know what he's implementing. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah. they're pickled and sealed at Area yeah. 51. Yeah, yeah. yeah seriously. But you, I, don't, you don't have the security I, clearance I, for that. Yeah, I really can't talk too much more about that. But you have the habanero pic- dill pickles, the yep. garlic pickles. And there's a jalapeno. 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 Yeah. Yep. They're very tasty. You have other local snacks as well. We do. Don't look at me. Well, I'm looking at you. This isn't my thing. Yeah. We have just a wealth of awesome purveyors of meat, cheese, produce. Angry uh, salads. You know, so to uh, be a local <laughs> brewery or any type of business and not utilize the uh, abundance of produce and food that we have here in Lancaster would be a mistake. You know, and, and, it's, and we've talked about this before in the podcast, but we are so incredibly freaking lucky to be doing a craft beer podcast which is awesome because we get to go to cool breweries and meet awesome people and drink awesome beers and get to see where those beers are made and all kinds of cool stuff but we get to do a craft beer podcast in pennsylvania where there's awesome beer and every brewery that has food has the best freaking food that you can get like anywhere because there is such a wealth of great local homegrown food in pennsylvania particularly in like central pennsylvania so are you saying you enjoyed your meat sandwich I enjoyed. I've enjoyed everything we've eaten at every brewery we've ever gone to. Sorry, it's a big beer. So, Rod, do you want to talk about some of the munchies you have? Well, uh, just off the top of your head, you know. Yeah, off the top of my head. So, uh, <laughs> we have we have a uh, a plethora of uh, panini style sandwiches. You like that word? Yeah, that was the the habanero beer. Uh, so. We have uh, panini sandwiches, meat and cheese platters. Uh, we, we do Rocky's Barbecue every Wednesday. So Rocky's Food Truck, if you're not aware, is a fantastic food truck. He, uh, he does all kinds of uh, barbecue, be it uh, ribs, uh, brisket, you name it. This guy is a pit master. He's going to be open full time uh, right next to us. Uh in the upcoming months, so that would be a, a great full time, as in like a, a an actual like yeah, like so, so not he, a truck, but like he a started off as a food truck. But yeah, he, I've seen the food truck around at like beer events and stuff. Yeah, and, yeah, he's gonna put in a uh, full kitchen and uh, full service right next door to us. That's pretty awesome. And uh, when that happens, we'll have his entire menu here. Does he so, make mac and cheese? Oh. The best mac and cheese. And I'm his sure his grandma, yeah, it's his grandma's recipe, and I'm telling you. It's the best. I've been twisting his arm for the recipe. Yeah, he refuses it, to give it to me. I've been trying to get him drunk enough to, to, to <laughs> give it up, and uh, it's just not happening. But well, you actually, can give him the Schwarzbier recipe, and he'll give you the mac and cheese. I doubt it. It's not going to happen. I doubt Rocky it. Rocky's a, a sixth-generation barbecuer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That absolutely. might be true. Yeah, so uh, we're really excited about Rocky's. One so. of the perks of the job is that I'm around here enough that I get to try a lot of this stuff. And what you can't tell because this is radio is that uh, I weigh 700 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't think from yeah. the voice. He doesn't, yeah. It doesn't sound like he weighs yeah. 700 Yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm fat. Chad has a face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> You're the thinnest guy at the In fact, table. he's lying. We actually suspended the microphone from the ceiling, and he's just lying on his back talking into the ceiling <laughs> yeah. this whole time. You I'm, can't see it. But. I'm in mobile. And we, we, Rich, Rich is just pouring the yes. beers directly into his mouth. And he's it's rubbing a, my body. And as soon as this is over, my fat uh, folds and as soon as Rich this is great. podcast is over, the uh, Columbia Fire Department is going to have to... <laughs> wheel my ass out of here. <laughs> Crane his ass out of here. So. Bring a forklift. Yep. Wow. Yep. So, uh, good beer, Chris. Are we? It's, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Full circle, right? What's, what's funny about the first two beers we drank is that uh, I didn't formulate them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's anyway. true. That's very true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Although, to be fair, the first one, you went to a lot of effort <laughs> to be able to make. So. Nah, Chris is a great brewer. It was fun, it was fun hanging out with him and brewing with him. But it was, it was fun mangoing with him. So we've, we've got a, a beer here that was actually, I'm, I'm assuming, created by you. Or Holy shit, I actually formulated this. All one. right. <laughs> wow. He can make yeah. beer. Oh, my God. Yeah. You were not kidding when you said that smelled like bourbon. It smells like Holy bourbon. Holy shit. How much bourbon's in this? 
Uh, that's hard to quantify. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, no, uh, oh uh, my God. How how young? Oh. How fresh is this out mm. of the barrel? Uh, uh, we racked this two weeks ago. Yeah. Two yeah. weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So this was uh, freshly dumped Buffalo Trace bourbon barrels. You know, in that terms of bourbon, yeah. Buffalo Trace is like hitting the lottery. It's not real bitey though. It's, it's actually quite smooth. It's surprisingly drinkable. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually really smooth. When you smell it, you think you're in for it. Yeah, like, by by the aroma, I'm just thinking I should be sitting there with a glass of whiskey on the rocks kind of thing. Yeah. And it's got an amazing, like, vanilla end to it and, like, aftertaste. Yeah, yeah, the complexity of um, what goes on in that barrel, it's uh, beyond scope. You know, you get that the vanilla notes from the ingression of the wood. Ooh. That's That's really good. I, and I've said this a million times, but I don't like... Uh, bourbon barrel aged beers like right out of the barrel I like when they're out of the barrel and then they sit for like six months in a bottle and they get the chance to have like that edge worn off a little bit but this is actually for only being uh, about like two weeks out is is quite smooth it's really good uh, may I speak on something as a brewer and uh, if Chris you is, may if absolutely Chris, not if Chris no. Harvey is listening no. to this he'll appreciate this all I've, the mangoes all the time exactly yeah. I've noticed in the homebrew community a fear of dark Roasted malt. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, you have black patent, which is the darkest ro- roasted malt you can have, and then you have some of it that's been the, the husk has been removed, and they call that, you know, Carafa, Carafa Spec Three, the highest roast level. I found that in the homebrew community, they tend to shy away from these heavy roasted malts, and I even have heard that some homebrewers are actually trying to make Russians without grain that has the husk on it. So, like, they're using these. Carafa type malts in this in this recipe, and what's interesting about the beers that we drank was Kalmbacher, the Schwartz beer, perfect example of a beer where you don't want husked roasted malt. You want to remove that husk so you have a smooth but dark beer. But in a Russian, it is in my professional opinion that you cannot make a good Russian without the husk. You have to have that there for that coffee, deep coffee chocolate character there. So I, I don't know maybe it's just the homebrewers that I've met or interacted with but uh, don't fear the don't fear the husk roast stuff I mean you can't brew a good Russian without it in my opinion don't fear the husk and can I just go on record and say Rich likes this Wow I imagine he would you know when I uh, you know two years ago when I met Rich he was just starting to get into the dark porter stouts that sort of thing he only drinks things that are boozy yeah okay. or limeritas or limeritas. <laughs> <laughs> They're not kidding. Do not no. plug that product. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've mentioned Rip and Rich and his lime readers plenty yeah. on the show. But, uh, this, I just, well, really I, I can't get over it. It's like how pronounced the bourbon is, and yet it's still so smooth and creamy yeah. and, and kind of it's, sweet. I w- something like this, off of the aroma, I would imagine it's a very bourbony taste. Like, almost to the point of you just have like a dark roasted bourbon mix, more or less. But this is very smooth. You get the vanilla, you get the roastiness. And... It's it's great. It's so good. It's comforting. That's a good word. Absolutely. It's, I feel is. like I'm drinking this and it's giving me a hook. You want like a fireplace and like a <laughs> Tolkien novel. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and perhaps a pipe. Yeah. Yes. Tobacco pipe. Or, you know, long bottom leaf. Exactly. Or one of those freshly wrapped cigars. Yes. Ah. You know what's interesting that. about these beers that we're drinking is they're both the same IBU. But they present it so differently. That's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Wrap your mind around that one. Well, it's like, um, I think it was Colin who said on the show at one time, you know, the IBU of a beer is like taking this table and measuring this point to this point and saying it's 18 inches, and that doesn't say a whole lot about the table. Exactly. Like, it's just one small aspect of it. Yeah, you have to look at the balance. So this, uh, the base beer for this, did you, uh, is this a recipe that you made to put in a barrel, or was it a recipe you had worked with before that you thought would go well in a barrel. Yeah, so I mean, I've brewed the unbarrel aged version of this beer a lot of times. This is Russian Imperial Stout. Right. Um, and uh, you know, certain beers lend themselves well to the barrel aging process. Um, some others that you would think wouldn't, that actually are, are still a good candidate. But any anytime you have a dark beer, that's usually pretty good for a barrel aging. Uh, every Christmas we release a traditional English barley wine that we've aged in bourbon barrels for three months. Oh, nice. You don't see a lot of people putting bee wines in barrels, but no, yeah, that, we do here. You also don't hear many people of, saying bee wine either. Right. Bee wine, yeah. That, that feels like a little bit of overkill, but I'm sure it's really good. <laughs> uh, it turns out. It turns yeah. out well. Yeah. 
but uh, you know, a beer like Russian, uh, if it's a good base beer, it can only get better in the barrel. Yeah. Now, are you guys? I I know. I think we talked about this before we were recording. Are you submitting anything to GABF? Because I think I remember this being the conversation for that. You want to take that one? Yeah. So uh, yeah. So barrel aged Russian is being submitted. Uh, unbarrel aged Russian is being submitted. Two separate categories. Yeah, two separate categories. Uh, the pumpkin beer that we do here every year is... And that's uh, with the smoked pumpkins, right? Yeah, that's the smoked pumpkins. Uh, that will go. And uh, there is a Belgian triple called Tricky Fingers that is going this year. Uh, the pumpkin, high-quality beer, really, really tasty. Kind of stumbled upon it. So, you know, he has a great recipe for it, brews it every year. Uh, we package some up. And just kind of forgot about it. And we busted a bottle out a couple months ago, and we were like, shit, this got better. Yep. To the point where we were like, I think this is competition worthy. So I've, I've, got, a, I've got a question about GABF. And it, it struck me earlier before we were drinking, so I know it's a legit question. Uh, <laughs> logistically, how do you send beer to GABF? Does somebody just pack it in a suitcase and hope it doesn't break in the plane? Or is there like an actual... You I would imagine keg, there's no right? courier ser- courier service. Do you send a keg? Do you like how would the how would the keg get from here to there? Does the keg go on the the freight part of the plane? No, no keg. They have packaging requirements. Um, it's based on the volume of the bottle only in bottles. Just like BJCP, it must be brown okay. unlabeled bottles. Uh, if you send 12 ounce bottles, you are required to send six. Uh, what 16 ounce bottles four, and I think if it's a 22 ounce bottle, you can send two or three. Uh, but they they have guidelines as far as the volume that they need to re- they need because they if it wins it, you need the to have the volume to be able to retaste the beer right right um, and so we packages up you know I send I, I go to my local postal service and uh, tell them that they're empty glass bottles tell them there's no liquid in there there's no liquid <laughs> in there well that. now you just have to click a button you know I don't oh, really? know you're at my, at my post office now it comes up and you have to click R is this 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 and this nope you just oh, click wow. no see even in Philly I still so have a person behind you don't the even have no there's a person there but the question is asked on the screen oh no they still verbally ask me the so question so I don't have to lie to a person now I just have to click and lie to a machine I had it's to, a lot easier see my problem is my local guy he's a craft beer fan and so he's like oh you're sending this out to Aurora Colorado is this GABF and I was like, or, or in the case of the spring, it was Craft Brewers Conference. I said, yes, 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 it is. And he was like, so these glasses are empty, wink, wink. And I was like, just it's, fucking it's post the, it. I don't want to have this conversation. It's for the label art competition. It's I a lied, empty bottle. I lied and said we were sending. Um, kitchen supplies. Yeah. I, was, I, was, I lied and said we were sending um, samples. Empty samples. But, like, empty that, samples. It, it Stop of, asking questions. <laughs> it blows my mind. So they have they have breweries from around the country that go in and submit their beer to it, but you figure they'd have some more elaborate submission style than just ship it out. Or they just make it legal to ship beer. I mean, or, or you well, Do you guys realize the amount of logistics that are required for the largest beer competition in the nation? Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the, they have a warehouse space, and the only reason that... Uh, they don't move it from Denver is the sheer amount of volunteers. Yeah. They need thousands of bodies just to sort, move, uh, just like organize the whole thing. It is a masterpiece the way they it's, run that it's, competition. It's, it's like it just to, I, I, we've ne- I've never been. Have you been? No, none of us have ever been. I've next been. year, next year um, we'll go next year. But it's like you know just to walk. The floor, like during you know, the, like it's just like it's it's like miles and miles and in the beer industry, we call it the beer Olympics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, and it started in what like a uh, seventy eight or like late seventies, yeah. I believe. And there was like thirty breweries there or something like that. And Charlie Papazian is by far the most humble man yeah. on the face of He's the earth. Awesome. I walked up to him; he wouldn't shake my hand, and the reason he wouldn't shake my hand was because it is so sore from shaking so many hands. <laughs> wow! And I'm not kidding; his right hand is wrapped in a bandage, and he'll fist bump you, but he will not shake your hand. Well, he can only tell that to so many people. And a given week, he will shake thousands and thousands yeah. and thousands of hands. But anyway, I walked up to him, I met him, and I was just like. Thank you. I, I appreciate everything you've done. What what? Tell me in your words what you're feeling on how this competition and JBF in general has grown. And he was like, "It's big." <laughs> I said, "It's big." Yeah. Big. I was yeah, like, "But know. like, I mean, from '70s to now, I mean, like, you've created something incredible, and not to mention the Birds Association and all the homebrew stuff that you've published, and like the amazing thing that you've done." And he was like, "I'm very blessed." 
That was it. This is the uh, this is the part of the show where we bring up random people to the microphone for no reason whatsoever, just to see what they have to <laughs> Which say. Which ride has green? And that's good. Yeah, Which I we just started doing much. right now. Talking to the mic. So, uh, what have you been drinking tonight? Pete. I'm uh, sorry, Pete. Pete. His name's yeah. Pete. Um, let's see. What did we drink tonight? Uh, it was a Russian Imperial. Oh, that's what we have in front that's of us right now. Yep. And how do, you, how do you feel about that? Well, I love it. It's really good, isn't it? Yeah. So you come here, you come I was here the, often. I was the first paying customer here two years ago. This Hi. place, this That's place awesome. is fantastic. We, we, we have his money behind a framed glass. Oh, you're like the first dollar. Like, yeah. that's your dollar. Well, it's my $20 bill, but that's... Oh, oh we do have a first $20. We're not going to argue. He doesn't well, mess around. You know, dollar doesn't get you much these days. <laughs> it's not going to buy you beer, that's, that's true. for sure. It might get you a pickle. Uh, yeah, t- maybe. But when a brewery opens, you don't order a pickle. <laughs> What's the your favorite beer that Columbia Kettle Works has ever brewed? Grinch Feet. Wow, I thought you were going to have to think about that. What's it called? Grinch Feet? Grinch Feet comes out at Christmas time. And is that the barley wine in a barrel? No, 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 no. So this is a beer that Rod formulated that he's been brewing since the inception of Columbia Kettle Works. It's a Christmas beer. Awesome beer. We also sent that to Craft Brewers Conference, and that nearly missed a medal. I mean, Was that the, missed. like, there's no fourth place? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. that was that one. All right. Yeah. Nice. Very yeah, nice. Yeah, great, great beer. Uh, aside from the pills, I would say that is our fastest seller. We sold out of a batch of Grinch Feet in two weeks. So, what Rod, is Rod, the Rod, tell the story behind the name. I'm actually curious. To I hear think about that matters. The name. I think that matters. He's like, I didn't want to talk anymore. That's why I took my headphones <laughs> off. Yeah, I tried tried to run away. So, Grinch Feet is uh, that that was named after our puppy dog. So, uh, our puppy dog had this, uh, you know, this strange hairy feet. And we used to always say that he had a Grinch feet. So uh, I was homebrewing this beer for forever, and uh, we named it after him. And he was my uh, my brewing assistant for the longest time. And uh, you know he's gone now, so his memory lives on. And uh, Grinch feet lives on, and uh, we'll brew that every single year. Very yeah, nice. nice. It's Very a great nice. beer. It's pretty awesome. I would describe it as a like a multi English American beer with spices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it has a, a ton of cherries, a uh, little bit of cinnamon, a little bit of vanilla, but it's uh, you know a lot of a lot of people will compare it to Mad Elf. Uh, okay, yeah. But it's not Mad Elf. It's not done with a Belgian ale yeast. It's done with a, just a straight up you know American ale yeast, uh, but. It's a beer that's true to my heart. It sounds delicious. It yeah. sounds delicious. So, um, uh, Pete, yeah. what what was the? Um, do you remember what was the first beer you had at Columbia Kettle Works? Oh man, that's the one he has to think about. I knew I'd get him. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you get as old as me uh, and you drink as many beers as I have, you tend to forget. No, yeah. we just ask the hard hitting questions. Yeah. That's just what it is. This is gotcha journalism right here. <laughs> I <laughs> got gotcha. Yeah, it probably was a coffee stout. That probably was the first. One. That's a good beer to start with. Are yeah, you a nice. fan of coffee stouts overall? Anything I can't see through. That is a fantastic. <laughs> that is a great way to measure. Wow, it's, it's a man who knows what he likes. <laughs> Simple and poignant. Yeah, anything I, I can't before see. Before I got intelligent, I was drinking Guinness. Hey, hey there's nothing wrong with Guinness. And you can't see through. Go to that. wedding beer. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. that's. Uh, I'm not so sure he's intelligent quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> It wow. doesn't compare to, you know, a good craft beer. Now we're making faces of, uh, at, at people there's my There's my co-brewer out there, my son, and my wife's out there, too. They're probably wondering where I'm at. <laughs> so, uh, I'm on a podcast, guys. Yeah, you're internet famous now. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> so you got a ride. You, my wife takes her home. The you just lost ride. your ride? Or? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I got the keys. Are you walking home? <laughs> Sometimes I should, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Who's uh, gonna get the pig out of the cold box? Steph. I know Steph. Steph. I think it's Steph's job. I, I think it goes without no saying. Pig. I say we ask the vegan. In fact, if if you take the pig out of the cold box, you can have an irate salad afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> what do the tomatoes do then? With this, a side of furious coleslaw. <laughs> yes. The knives get involved. <laughs> Don't forget, come to the Kettleworks in Columbia. 
the best beer in central Pennsylvania. Boom. That is it. Sold. Amazing. Cut it. That's commercial. it. Perfect. That's it. Got it, and we're done. That's right. Yep, we paid him a lot. <laughs> Here you, there you go. go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, so if you guys want to check out Columbia Kettleworks, uh, go to ColumbiaKettleworks.com. Go to Facebook.com slash whatever their Facebook page is. Twitter <laughs> is at whatever their Twitter handle is. Oh, it's CKWPA. There you go. It's it's, it's the internet, man. Like, it's not I hard to, to find urinate. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's the vault. Let's just let's just get this All let's right. get this over. Right, with. Yeah. Patreon.com slash beerbusters, audibletrial.com slash beerbusters. Go to the Pottstown Brew Fest. Uh, our hundredth episode is happening September twenty third at Canal Street in Reading, Pennsylvania. Be there or be square. Thank you very much. This is the end, unfortunately, of another episode of Beer Busters Podcast. They're no longer at the table, but I would really like to say thanks to the guys at Columbia Kettleworks for having us You know, it's a good here. episode when your guests get up before we're as, done. As he literally just said, he had, well, one had tyranny, the other is uh, helping the, Pete, I believe that was his name that we just had on. That we, we had three beers tonight, and they were all very good, and they were very strong. So if you come here, make sure you have solid and reliable uh, sober transportation. transportation home. Absolutely. Uh, well, I'm Dan Baker, joined as always by the co-host and brewologist. Angry Steph Hefner. Angry Salad Steph Hefner. And the demented and fermented. Wayne Baker. I think we hurt some squids this time. Uh, irritated vegetable medley. Peace out, bitches. <laughs> <laughs>